to meet you. You're not that lawyer on late night television, are you? Better call Saul. <laughs> Full timeline. How Jimmy McGill became Saul Goodman and what happened to him. Better call Saul is finally over. And while it didn't end with Saul getting away with everything he had done, like most of us had hoped he would, but with Jimmy McGill going behind bars for all the choices he ended up making in his life. So far beyond you! I'm like a god in human clothing! Lightning bolts shoot from my fingertips! Over the course of six fantastic seasons, Bob Odenkirk took the seemingly one-directional, uber-sleazy scumbag lawyer from Breaking Bad and turned him into a psychological case study for the ages. Payday to you, huh? The only way that entire car is worth 500 bucks is if there's a $300 hooker sitting in it. His performance as James McGill or Saul Goodman has been so amazing that he received a Hollywood Critics Award for Best Actor in a drama series even before the finale dropped. And his performance in Saul Gone Alone might just earn him the ever elusive Emmy. What'd you say to Babyface, huh? Why don't you say anything stupid? By anything stupid, I mean anything at all. But now that Better Call Saul is finally over and Vince Gillian doesn't plan on making any new shows related to the Breaking Bad universe, we thought this would be the perfect time to give you guys a full breakdown of how Jimmy became Saul in the first place. So, without further ado, this is the full timeline of James Morgan McGill, aka Saul Goodman. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Wait, that's right, Howard. You know why I didn't take the job? Because it's too small! I don't care about it! November 12th, 1960. James Morgan McGill is born, the second son of Ruth and Charles Lindbergh McGill Sr. Young Jimmy has a 15-year-old brother, Charles Lindbergh Chuck McGill Jr., who graduated as a valedictorian from Francis Xavier High School a year before Jimmy's birth and was studying at the University of Pennsylvania for most of his formative years. Jimmy was born in the town of Cicero, Illinois, which was named after the famed Roman diplomat and lawyer who was was active before, during, and after the rise and fall of Julius Caesar. Is she gonna be okay? She'll be fine, Jimmy. How do you know? Just listen. The mid-1960s. Chuck reads his brother Jimmy a passage from The Adventures of Mabel, a children's fantasy book written by Harry Thurston Peck. The passage he is reading to Jimmy is about a wolf who is apparently stalking Mabel as its prey. Jimmy asks his brother if Mabel was going to be okay, and Chuck replies that she will. When he asks his brother how he knows this for sure, Chuck simply asks him to just listen and he would see for himself. The two brothers sit in a lamp-lit tent in the backyard of their parents' home. Find those spark plugs, maybe we'll get your car started for you, okay? Come on, Jimmy, just man the till, okay? And I'll just be back in a jiff. August 1973, Jimmy starts working at his father's store to lend his family a helping hand. But instead of actually doing something at the store, he spends his time reading Playboy magazines. A customer walks into their store looking for some help. It seems like he has a medical emergency and he asks Charles Sr. for some loose change and meds. Jimmy immediately realizes that the guy is a con man and goes to guard the till while his father naively rummages for materials to help the dude. While Jimmy manages to successfully prevent the man from conning his father, he learns a lesson that would end up sticking with him his entire life. The con man tells Jimmy that there are two types of people in this world, sheep and wolves. He refers to Jimmy's dad as a sheep, innocent, kind, helpful and oblivious to the realities of society to a fault. He asks Jimmy if he wants to grow up as a sheep or a wolf and the young kid chooses the former as he slips some money out of his dad's till into his own pocket, thus beginning his life of crime. No. In high school, he had a thriving business making fake IDs so his buddies could buy beer. You're going all the way back to high school, huh? The mid-70s. Jimmy McGill enters high school and starts running a fake ID business to help his buddies buy alcohol, despite being underage. This would become one of the first elaborate scam businesses that Jimmy would end up engaging in. It is also around this time that he became fast friends with fellow schoolgoer and scam artist in the making, Marco Pasternak. The pair became a local menace in Cicero and would often embark on scams together, particularly slip and fall incidents during winter when they could find a nice patch of ice together. These slipping scams earned Jimmy the nickname Slippin' Jimmy. It's time to 
time to make some changes. Hey, listen to me. You're slipping Jimmy. What do you got to change, huh? Late 1970s. Jimmy's brother Chuck returns home to Cicero after having graduated magna cum laude from Georgetown University Law Center to help his father get his ailing corner store back on track. Happened, but I discovered $14,000 was just gone. While tallying up the store's books, Chuck discovers that his father has lost $14,000 over several years and immediately assumes that the thief had to be Jimmy. Chuck, of course, idolizes his father and refuses to see him as anything less than a saint. He doesn't consider the possibility that Charles Sr.'s open-handed policy might have been the true catalyst of the store's downfall and immediately points his fingers at Jimmy, who is the only logical suspect in this case. While Chuck is correct to an extent, his father refuses to believe Jimmy could have stolen money from the till and shuts down the store instead. Six months after doing this, Charles McGill Sr. passes away. At the funeral, Jimmy bawls his eyes out, but Chuck realizes that this is just an act and starts seeing his brother in a very different light. And your mom, you know, I think she knew we were skipping, but she'd always stop what she was doing, give me a pack of little Debbie's. Early to mid-1980s, Jimmy and Marco Pasternak returned to the abandoned departmental store that used to be the McGill families to recover something. Jimmy pries open a ceiling tile and recovers an old metallic band-aid box, from which he takes out an Indian head penny, which he wants to use in a scam. I know what it is. It's a George Washington silver. I tell my dad, Pop, this quarter is rare. It's he explains to Marco that at one time his father tried to give up a rare George Washington half dollar bill without getting any recompense for it because of how good natured he was. Marco expresses genuine remorse for the closing down of Jimmy's family store, but Jimmy squarely lays the blame at his father's feet, showing you that he never really felt as strongly for his old man as he made it look like at his funeral. Something we would see from him later on as well. 1987 to 1991. Jimmy cuts off contact with his mother and his brother to fully embrace his life as a con artist. During these four years, he develops the identity of Saul Goodman and gets married to his first wife, who remains nameless throughout the series. Jimmy and Marco continue to coast through life in Cicero by running innumerable scams. But Jimmy's wife ends up cheating on him with a guy called Chet, and this marks a turning point in his life. You keep the cash? I'll just keep the watch. Well, it's worth like three grand, man. <sighs> three thousand, easy. No. Yeah. 1992. Jimmy, using a Saul Goodman alias, runs a fake Rolex scam on an unsuspecting Mark with help from his buddy Marco. After running this scam, Jimmy ends up in serious legal trouble for performing a Chicago sunroof. A drunken Jimmy encountered his ex-wife's new lover, Chet, and decided to take revenge on him for stealing his girl. So he defecated through the sunroof of Chet's car, but he was unaware of the fact that his children were in the backseat, which landed him in serious legal trouble. Jimmy called his mother for the first time in five years to get himself the best legal representation that he could think of. Chuck re-enters Jimmy's life as one of the most respected criminal law practicing attorneys from the Southwest. He informs his delinquent brother that the only way he is going to help him is if he quits his life as a con artist, moves to Albuquerque with him and starts over in the mailroom of Chuck's law firm HHM. Say it. Please, Chuck. Jimmy, knowing that this is a crossroads moment for him, accepts his brother's deal. After meeting Marco one last time, who bemoans the fact that going straight is a waste of time for slipping Jimmy's skills, he moves to New Mexico and starts working at HHM in earnest. A week after working at HHM, Jimmy is invited to meet Chuck's then wife, Rebecca Dubois. Chuck Free of electromagnetic hypersensitivity at this point, warns his wife that their guest is an acquired taste. But Jimmy manages to charm the pants off Rebecca with his natural charm and lawyer jokes. Chuck is visibly jealous of his social skills, but remains this, silent. This is total BS. I'm, I'm talking to him tonight. Jimmy, no. You'd only make things worse. I'll explain it to him. 1993. 
Jimmy settles into his HHM mailroom job and becomes a hit with the other employees, as well as Howard Hamlin, who nicknames him Charlie Hustle. Jimmy organizes betting pools for the Oscars whilst doing his rounds and is seemingly in something of a relationship with fellow mailroom employee Kim Wexler. Kim, who is an expiring lawyer herself, is being tutored and mentored by HHM name partner Howard Hamlin and looks up to Chuck for his brilliant legal mind. Chuck answers Kim's questions on case law but continues to treat Jimmy like a nuisance despite the fact that his brother is actually doing honest work at this point. Jimmy, inspired by the two most important people in his life, resolves to become a lawyer himself. Ye you passed the bar? Yeah, I did. 1993 to 1997. From 1993 to 1997, Jimmy spends his time divided between working at the HHM mailroom and preparing to become a lawyer. He enrolls into a distance learning course from this University of American Samoa and works hard to earn his occupation, but he fails his first two attempts at clearing the bar exam. Jimmy passes the bar exam on his third try in 1997 and tells his brother Chuck about it, hoping it would eventually land him a job at HHM. He celebrates in the mailroom with his his friend Ernesto and Kim as well, sharing a warm kiss with the latter. But his party is cut short when Howard Hamlin enters the mailroom and informs Jimmy that the partners have unanimously decided not to take him on as an attorney because it would look like nepotism. Jimmy, unaware that Chuck has put Howard up to this, develops a grudge against the man. He quits HHM and starts a solo practice from the back of Mrs. Nguyen's nail salon. Chuck vouches for Jimmy at his swearing-in ceremony and the two brothers get drunk with each other and sing karaoke at a local bar. The return home singing ABBA's The Winner Takes It All. Seriously, Chuck, we gotta eat it. Oh, Mom will be okay for a few minutes. It's been three days. It could be three more. 1997 to 1999. During this time, Kim Wexler becomes one of HHM's go-to attorneys and her life becomes separated from Jimmy's. We can assume that this is the time period where Jimmy marries his second wife because he later tells one of his business associates that he caught said spouse in bed with his stepfather and the Chicago sunroof incident happened with a man called Chet. In fact, it is quite possible that this discovery is what caused Ruth McGill to go into a coma in 1999, but we can never be sure because this is never revealed. Neither are the identities of Jimmy's ex-wives for the duration of their marriages. But it is in 1999 that Jimmy visits Cicero again after seven years of having been away from his past. He spends three days with his brother in their mother's hospital room. The whole time, the pair decide not to leave the room because anything might happen at any moment. But an optimistic Jimmy finally gets up to go bring his brother some hoagies. Jimmy? No, Mom, it's me, Chuck. Unfortunately for him, tragedy would strike right then, as Jimmy's mother would pass away in his absence. When he realizes what has happened, he breaks down, asking Chuck if their mother said anything in her final moments but her brother only replies that she said nothing. It is revealed to the audience that she asked for Jimmy with her dying breath, and a jealous Chuck hid that fact from him for the rest of his life. It is also around this time that Chuck's EHS symptoms start showing up, though he is able to manage going about as usual for most of his days. Mode, uh, sockets and stuff are looking A-OK. -okay. I'm gonna check again just to make sure we're almost there. Good, good. Um... 2001. 2001 is the year that Chuck's EHS symptoms reached their peak and he can no longer hide his condition. He has Jimmy aid him in an elaborate scheme to hide his condition from his wife whilst having dinner with her, but it all breaks down thanks to Rebecca's phone etiquette. Shortly after this incident, Rebecca and Chuck get divorced and Chuck takes an extended sabbatical from HHM. Jimmy, feeling responsible for his brother and having great respect for the man he was, decides not to delegate Chuck's care to HHM, but to look into it himself. This begins his daily routine of visiting multiple newsstands, motels and grocery stores to get Chuck the supplies he would need to live properly on a day-to-day -day basis. Bargain what I did for them? They're going to jail, ain't they? So since when does that matter? May 2002, James Morgan McGill struggles to make an honest living as a public defender 
whilst trying to take care of his housebound brother. He provides his services to three teenagers who had violated a corpse at a morgue and is dismayed, to say the least, by the pay he receives for his efforts. He is visibly struggling with the demands of his brother's lifestyle, but refuses to delegate the work to anyone else and resolves to find himself a new, more lucrative client however he can. He comes into contact with the Kettlemans and decides to con the embezzling couple into getting their services and puts the Lindholm twins to his employ after bedazzling them with stories about Slip and Jimmy. Unfortunately for all three of them, their plan ends up getting them into contact with Tuco Salamanca, giving Jimmy his first taste of real cartel violence. He is able to talk Tuco down from brutally killing the twins for disrespecting his abuelita to breaking one leg each, for which he calls himself the world's greatest lawyer. Jimmy's brother finds out about the incident, but he insists that he is still on the straight and narrow. The next words out of your mouth ought to be the truth. You understand? June 2002. Jimmy is approached by Nacho Varga, one of Tuco's lieutenants, with a proposition. If Jimmy helps Nacho rip off the Kettlemans, he will get a neat sum as a finder's fee. Though visibly desperate for the money, Jimmy declines. Nacho ominously informs Jimmy that he was in the game now, but Jimmy reasserts his position as a legit lawyer and even alerts the Kettlemans to Nacho's robbery attempt anonymously. When they disappear and Nacho is picked up by the cops based on his information, Jimmy is forced to work out a deal that will spring Nacho while also bringing the Kettlemans to justice. He is able to pull it off, but not without deep, great personal loss. After getting a $30,000 retainer from the Kettlemans, Jimmy decides to mess with Howard Hamlin for asking him not to practice under the name of McGill by putting up a billboard promoting his own firm which is near identical to HHM's trademarked branding. After being forced to take down the billboard, he stages a fall and rescue incident to drum up publicity for his practice, and it works. He gets a few eccentric clients, yes, but he also gets to meet Geraldine Strauss, who asks him to draw up her will and opens the doors for alleged practice in elder law. Chuck is understandably furious by the fact that Jimmy was slipping back into his old habits and ends up being hospitalized in his attempt to expose Jimmy, which reveals that his EHS is completely psychosomatic. Jimmy refuses to have his brother institutionalized and takes him home, determined to remain on the path that he has chosen. While doing the rounds for his elder law practice, Jimmy visits Irene Landry at Sandpiper Crossing and comes across information that helps him create a class action lawsuit against a national housing company. Jimmy brings his findings to Chuck and the brothers manage to spend the few brief moments of togetherness while working on the case. Chuck even forgets about his EHS for a brief moment and it encourages Jimmy to fight Chweekert and Coakley alongside his brother. But he is betrayed by Chuck when he gives the case over to HHM behind Jimmy's back and he later finds out that his prospects dying out at HHM were his brother's doing. He realizes that his brother is only okay with him as long as he is under his thumb. So he hands over the Sandpiper case and Chuck's daily care to HHM and leaves. During all this, he also represented Mike Ermentrott when he was visited by Philadelphia PD regarding the case of a few dead cops and helped him clear his name, which started their long-term criminal association. In fact, Mike was the one who helped Jimmy locate the Kettlemans and he would also provide his services as a cleaner to Jimmy, which solidified him as a contact for him. Come back, cover. Uh, I'm going to take a short break because somebody needs legal help. <laughs> July 2002. Jimmy is conducting a bingo game at one of his client's fishing spots and has a complete mental breakdown which culminates in him returning to Cicero. There he reconnects with his old buddy Marco, who is sad that Jimmy didn't come to see him when he visited in 1999 and also extremely depressed with his current job situation. Jimmy finds him asleep at the table of their old haunt and the two immediately run a scam on a nearby patron. Marco and Jimmy slip right back to their old ways, going on a con binge that lasts for three weeks and ends with Jimmy, sorry, Saul Goodman, living through his Kevin Costner story. You are not Kevin Costner. I was last night. At the end of the three weeks, 
Jimmy checks his phone and realizes he has relapsed hard and wants to return to his clients and Kim. Marco expresses his admiration for Jimmy, saying that slipping Jimmy as a lawyer was the dream job for a con artist like him, but Jimmy wants to say genuine to the ideals he has developed. He clearly struggles with his moral fiber, but agrees to running one last scam before going back to ABQ. Sadly, Marco passes away in the middle of the scam and Jimmy is left devastated. His best friend's last words to him were that these three weeks were the best of his life and Jimmy receives Marco's pinky ring as an inheritance. After leaving Marco's funeral, he gets a call from Kim who informs him that Davis and Maine have become involved with the Sandpiper case and that they are willing to offer him a partner track position. Jimmy realizes the amount of effort Kim must have put into getting him this offer and accepts on call for her sake. Jimmy arrives at the meeting but pulls Kim aside and asks her if his answer would change things between them. When she says it wouldn't, he politely declines the offer and tells Mike that he is never making the same mistake he made with the Kettlemans ever again while humming Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple. Jimmy moves out of his law office and starts scamming guests at a luxury hotel, telling his clients he has stopped practicing law. Kim tracks him down and tries to convince him to take the Davison main job, but he convinces her to run a scam with him. The couple spend a passionate night together, but the next morning Jimmy realizes what Kim truly wants from him and takes the job at Davis and Maine. Despite it being everything he wanted from his job as a lawyer, Jimmy is clearly dissatisfied. He works hard on the Sandpiper case, but knows that his con artist tricks won't work anymore, so he grows ever more frustrated by the dissonance between who he is and who he is supposed to be. And this is only exacerbated when Chuck enters the deliberations as co-counsel at HHM, which throws Jimmy completely off his game. He decides to let off some steam by helping Mike with a morally flexible defense for one Daniel Warmalt, for whom Jimmy creates the infamous Squat Cobbler story and the video. After regaining the taste of creative conning once again, Jimmy embarks on a scheme to bolster the Sandpiper case using tactics that Kim tacitly disapproves of. Oh, but you can call me Jimmy. Hey everyone, my name's Jimmy McGill. I'm an attorney at law, but... Uh... August 2002. This entire month is a representation of Jimmy choosing the illegal life over the straight and narrow path his brother had laid out for him years ago. The first indication comes when Jimmy bribes a bus driver working for Sandpiper into allowing him to solicit more clients for his class action lawsuit. The scam works perfectly, but Jimmy's antics are questioned once Chuck enters the proceedings to bear witness. Jimmy manages to prevent any heavy scrutiny from Chuck or Cliff Main, but finds that Sandpiper has caught on to him and advised their residents to reject legal solicitation. So he tries to air a very provocative ad filmed illegally besides, in order to draw more attention to the case Davis and Maine were building. Jimmy thinks about clearing it with Cliff Maine first, but decides against it ultimately and airs the ad by himself. It works. The ad brings in dozens of new plaintiffs for DNM in relation to the Sandpiper case. But because Jimmy does not follow the rules, he is reprimanded for his actions and saddled with a babysitter in the form of Erin Bell. Unbeknownst to Jimmy, Kim is being punished by Howard at HHM for her involvement with the airing of the ad. Once he does find out, he realizes the true extent of the consequences of his actions, but Kim simply tells him that she fixes things for herself and works hard to get out of Doc Review by landing Mesa Verde for HHM. But things don't work out the way she had hoped. I tender my resignation to Davis and Maine. Tender is better than submit, yeah? Resignation? September 2002. After realizing that the life of a squeaky clean desk job isn't for him and that he won't get his bonus if he resigns, Jimmy pulls out all the garish suits in his wardrobe and becomes as much of a nuisance as he can to get fired from Davis and Maine whilst retaining his bonus. Cliff Maine reluctantly does so, knowing full well Jimmy's intentions, but when he questions Jimmy why he went to such lengths, Jimmy only replies that he's a square peg trying desperately to fit into a round hole, and that it was time for him to be himself. He later breaks the news to Kim, who realizes that Jimmy is right about going off on his own and becoming his very own boss. Kim decides to take up Jimmy on his offer on starting a joint practice, with her own addendums of course, and thus Wexler McGill is born in a former dentist's office. 
The pair decides to hire Francesca Liddy as their receptionist, and Kim prepares to take Mesa Verde with her husband, but Howard and Chuck beat her to it, just as Jimmy had predicted. Outraged by HHM's treatment of Kim, Jimmy takes matters into his own hands and uses his old-school forgery tricks to end HHM's business relationship with Mesa Verde. He arrives at Chuck's home when he is asleep and doctors the files overnight right before the day of an important hearing. Chuck realizes what has happened and pulls Jimmy up on it but cannot come up with any proof. Kim knows as well, but while she is happy to regain Mesa Verde, she is deeply concerned with what Jimmy did in order to help her. Chuck starts obsessing over his mistake and deduces that Jimmy had done something to his files when he was without. He interrogates the copy store owner who helped Jimmy with his scam but fails to get anything out of him and has an EHS attack which ends with him cracking his skull on the counter. Jimmy, who was witnessing his master plan unfold expertly, is horrified by his brother's predicament and immediately rushes to help him. When Chuck is better in the hospital the next day, he immediately accuses Jimmy of tampering with his documents but Ernesto clears him, much to Jimmy's surprise. He then learns from Ernie just how deep Chuck's vendetta is against him, to the point it consumes his every waking hour. Jimmy helps Chuck get out of hospital and brings him back home, but is later called by a panicked Howard who claims that Chuck has quit HHM. When Jimmy arrives at Chuck's home, he finds it covered in space blankets and worries that his scam has broken his brother's already disturbed mental state. Jimmy ends up confessing to the scam in order to help his brother recover mentally and tells him he did so to make them both feel better. Chuck is outraged that Jimmy committed a felony but seemingly understands why it had to happen. The brothers take down the space blankets from the walls and have a brief moment of genuine bonding when they discuss reading the adventures of Mabel together as children. But Chuck leaves Jimmy with an ominous warning. He says he will not forget what has happened here and that Jimmy will pay. Jimmy doesn't get it at first, but when he hears from Kim that Ernesto overheard the conversation he had with Chuck regarding the Mesa Verde numbers, he realizes his brother had extended an olive branch and then decided to stick it in the jugular. Enraged and ignoring Kim's advice, he breaks into Chuck's home and destroys the tape, berating his brother for having always hated him, but is witnessed in the act of committing a felony by Howard and Chuck's P.I. Chuck presses charges and Jimmy is arrested spending a night at Bernalillo County Detention Center. Ignoring Kim's advice, yet again he represents himself and posts bail, intent on fighting his legal problems himself. But when Kim realizes that Chuck's true goal is to get Jimmy debarred from ever practicing law again, she forces her way onto his legal team with a new plan. These are museum quality. You, my friend, are the Ansel Adams of covert photography. October 2002. Jimmy hires Mike to pose as a repairman and has him take dozens of pictures of Chuck's living conditions. When Chuck was hospitalized the first time, Dr. Cruz made note of the fact that all the lanterns and loose paper he was keeping around were an invitation for a house fire, and Jimmy knew that no jury would be able to deny that Chuck was mentally ill after seeing these pictures. Mike executes his job flawlessly, as usual, and hands over the pictures to Jimmy at Loyola's diner, where he is called the Ansel L. Gort of covert photography, and we find it hard to discredit this particular analogy of his. He and Kim spend the next three months preparing his defense against Chuck. I'm looking for someone with a light touch. I'm not talking some teenager taking a five-finger discount of string cheese at the stop. February 2003. A few days before Jimmy's disbarment hearing, he contacts Dr. Caldera and acquires the services of the light-touched Huel Babino, who helps Jimmy plant a fully charged battery on Chuck on the day of his hearing. At the hearing, Jimmy presents Mike's pictures and his own personal testimony as evidence that his brother hates him, and the entire hearing has been orchestrated by Chuck to get Jimmy to never practice law again. Chuck, of course, denies this, calling Jimmy's arguments and off-book methods sorry little tricks, but then his brother goes in for the kill. Jimmy asks Chuck to check his right breast pocket, and when his brother realizes that he has had a battery on him this entire time, he launches an angry tirade against Jimmy, which proves to a stunned courthouse that this was, in fact, all personal. 
As a result of Chuck's meltdown, Jimmy avoids total disbarment but is still suspended from practicing law for a calendar year. So he calls all his clients with Francesca and tells them he is on a sabbatical. He also attends a visit from a distraught Rebecca who has been trying to contact Chuck since the hearing incident but finds out that she was only a pawn in Jimmy's scheme to expose his brother. Disgusted by what has happened, she tells Jimmy Chuck was right about him all along and leaves. Jimmy tries to recoup the money he has already spent on several commercial slots, but when he fails to do so, he runs an advertisement for Saul Goodman Productions instead, which is the first time he officially uses the identity to promote himself. Kim notes that this Saul guy had a certain energy about him, and this seems to intrigue Jimmy. You're saying we got expenses, man. You, exp you don't have expenses. I've got expenses. You see this? This is money I've already spent on airtime for that commercial. March 2003. Jimmy struggles to make ends meet. He is running out of cash very quickly as every advertising opportunity he has comes to a dead end. He tries to keep it quiet when he is with Kim, but she can see how bad things are and starts considering taking on a second client. Jimmy instead begins resorting to cons once again. He first cons the owners of a music store into buying his commercial slots by staging a slip and slide incident. He tries to get something out of his insurance company, but when he fails to do so, he reveals Chuck's mental illness to them, causing HHM's malpractice insurance rates to skyrocket. He then helps a drug dealer at his community service go attend to business by telling off his bullish supervisor using his legal knowledge, which earns him $700. He visits a bar with Kim and starts talking about a credit card scam they can pull at one of the patrons. In desperate need of money, he calls it off when he sees Kim is genuinely upset by all of it. Jimmy decides to solve his monetary problems another way and works on manipulating Irene Landry, the representative of the Sand Piper case, into accepting the settlement, which would see him personally net a little over a million dollars. He meets with Howard first, trying to do things the right way, but when that doesn't work, he dupes Irene into agreeing with his proposition, effectively alienating her from her friends in the process. Jimmy's various cons work out, and Irene gets into a position where she is ready to do what he has been suggesting to her all month long. But when Kim has her car crash, he realizes how big of a mistake he was making. Jimmy calls Erin Bell from Davison, Maine and has her help him help Irene get her friends back by exposing his manipulation of them. While taking care of Kim, he has a change in heart and goes to see Chuck but is shocked to see his brother having reinstalled electrical appliances again. Jimmy is genuinely happy for his brother, expressing joy at the fact that Chuck has finally overcome his EHS. He moves on to apologize for his actions but Chuck cuts him short and coldly tells him that he had never cared for him and that Jimmy should own up to who he is. At least that way, Chuck would respect him more. He leaves thoroughly depressed by this revelation, but is forced to face his own actions when Howard calls him later and tells him that Chuck has tragically passed away. Jimmy and Kim rush to Chuck's place and are met with a horror scene. The entire place is burnt down and Chuck's electrical appliances are in the backyard. Jimmy realizes that his brother relapsed and something must have happened to cause it. He blames himself for it and spends the rest of the day in deep deeper despair than before, to the point he doesn't even hear Howard narrate Chuck's obituary. Jimmy goes to Chuck's funeral and receives sympathy from everyone there but Howard and Rebecca. Howard later turns up at Kim's apartment and tells Jimmy what he thinks has happened. He believes that Chuck passed away because Howard pushed him out of HHM thanks to an issue with the company's malpractice insurance. Jimmy realizes he was right about why Chuck died, but seeing Howard take the blame upon his shoulders, he lets it slide onto him telling him it was his cross to bear. Jimmy, much like his biggest mistakes in life, defers responsibility to someone else and starts going about his own life in a dangerous, casual manner. But I can tell you this, none of them will have the connection to your machines that I do. April 2003. Jimmy, as part of his PPD, starts looking for jobs but struggles to find something to his liking. He scams the owner of Neff Copiers out of an expensive Hummel figurine and splits the proceeds with Ira, surprised at the amount of money one job had yielded. While collecting his inheritance from Chuck's estate, a measly $5,000, he notices that HHM looks more bare bones than before and inquires as to what had happened. Howard admits the firm was struggling because of Chuck's estates and Jimmy gives Howard a speech that inflames him enough to abuse Jimmy out of his office. Jimmy asks 
asks Howard to use that rage and get the firm back on its feet. After returning home from his scam with Nefcopias, Jimmy reads the letter that Chuck left him. It was clearly written while Jimmy was working in the mailroom, and it was a genuine admission of pride from Chuck in Jimmy's new life choices. While it makes Kim break down, Jim dismisses the letter nonchalantly, further indicating how far down the rabbit hole he truly was. During this time, Jimmy also starts a new job at a mobile company called CC Mobile, where he discovers a secret that would become a trademark of his characterization in the future. Jimmy initially struggles to sell a single phone, but when his ploy of selling privacy attracts a customer looking to hide from the IRS, Jimmy comes up with a plan. He decides to start an illicit drop phone business, whereby he would sell phones at an upmarked price to criminals, whilst also promoting his law practice when he regains his license. Using his Saul Goodman alias, he arrives at the doghouse, the site of the birth of Wexler McGill, and sells a bunch of phones that he came with. On his way back, he is mugged by three teenagers, whom he later punks into silence, with a little help from Huell and his friend Clarence. From this point onward, Jimmy McGill begins selling drop phones attached with his business card out of his car trunk under the alias Saul Goodman and starts effectively leading a dual life. ...to use these things to sell drugs. What my customers do with the phones after they leave my possession, that's their business. May 2003 to January 2004. During these months, Jimmy spends his time building up his drop phone business while serving his suspension. Huell becomes his personal bodyguard and the pair makes bank selling prepaid phones to Albuquerque's criminal element whilst also promoting Saul Goodman's eventual return to law. Jimmy and Kim drift apart due to the difference in their life choices to the point that even though they live together, they barely see each other. Jimmy had hoped to restart Wexler McGill with Kim when he got reinstated, but it became clear to him that Mesa Verde and pro bono work is what truly made Kim happy. So he backed off and focused on his future career as Saul Goodman. I don't know. I think my customer base is right here. Get some new customers. I don't feel the need to. January 2004. Jimmy attends a party with Kim at her firm and is shaken by her success. Feeling belittled but not wanting to emasculate Kim, Jimmy begins frolicking a bit too much at the party, essentially mocking the guests with disguised holiday destination suggestions. Kim doesn't say anything about it, but she is clearly concerned. Later, Jimmy is approached by a plainclothes officer named Platt, who asks him if he is Saul Goodman. Jimmy realizes Platt wants to get him out of his business, but isn't able to convince him to leave him alone, legally, because Huell arrives and takes Platt out as soon as he smells trouble. The problem was that if he had been hearing Jimmy, he'd have heard him tell Huell that the guy was a cop, which could have saved them both a lot of trouble. Jimmy realizes Huell is more inclined to D.B. Cooper this situation rather than deal with it, so Kim steps in and helps him run a scam to get Huell off without jail time, after she realizes that Huell is being held because of a bias against him and Jimmy. Devotion in Kushada. Well, ma'am, for starters, He's a bona fide hero. February 2004. Kim takes on Huell's case and represents him in court. Meanwhile, Jimmy executes the illicit part of their plan by traveling to Kushata, Louisiana, in a bus and forging dozens of letters in support of Huell as a local hero. Jimmy also sets up a massively complex soundboard at Mrs. Nguyen's backroom to aid with the scam when the ADA's office inevitably calls to check in with Huell's supporters. Kim, meanwhile, uses shock and awe tactics to force Suzanne Erickson to comply with her terms. When Jimmy is able to successfully con Suzanne into thinking he is the local pastor of Kushata and that Huell is indeed a local hero, she has no choice but to comply with Kim's demands. Jimmy assumes that going through all this with Kim yet again has finally soured her on him. But to his surprise, she shoves him against the wall at the courthouse stairwell and passionately kisses him yet again. The next time they run a con together, it would be Kim who would propose it. Mitch Schweiker could have boned me to him and I'm this close to being reinstated. I mean, come on. March 2004. Jimmy helps Kim pull off a scam to get Mesa Verde, a bigger branch in Lubbock, Texas, after Kevin, Kim's boss, expresses that desire to her in a meeting. They manage to dupe the clerk 
in charge of approving plans into signing off on duplicates with much larger building dimensions and later celebrate their victory. Jimmy is a week away from regaining his law license at this point and has decided to use the client base he has created with his drop phone business to practice criminal law. Kim expresses doubt, but Jimmy reminds her that it is no different from her scamming Mesa Verde. When Jimmy's hearing comes up, he is sure that he will be reinstated, but is enraged to find out he hasn't because he failed to express remorse over or even mention the very victim of his first hearing, Chuck. Jimmy visits Kim in an irate state and starts blaming everyone for his problems as usual and later comes to her place to gather his things and leave. But she manages to make him stay and comes up with a plan to help him regain his license. Through a series of obviously staged yet just convincing enough displays of grief, which included Jimmy mourning over Chuck's grave at his one-year death anniversary and donating a law library anonymously in his brother's name, Jimmy manages to get a second hearing for his reinstatement. At the hearing itself, he plans to use Chuck's letter to win the panel over, but noticing that it wouldn't be enough, he breaks into an impromptu speech about how Chuck and the law meant the most to him. It was so moving that the panel immediately reinstated his license and it even moved Kim to tears. But when she met up with him outside, she realized he had been faking it the entire time. Jimmy didn't care about a single word he had said in there and was never going to go by the name McGill again. Picking up a DBA form from the clerk who was handing him his reinstatement forms, he told Kim, it's all good man, and walked away with a smile, thus birthing Saul Goodman. You're going to call yourself Saul Goodman. I'm already calling myself Saul Goodman. We've talked about this. The scales who have been buying my phones. April to May 2004. Jimmy, now going by Saul Goodman, plans to start his new venture by hosting a sale of his remaining drop phones and putting his number on their speed dials. He sells out and promises the people that didn't get his phones a 50% off on non-violent felonies. Hewell tells him he did good, but Saul only says that they are getting started. Goodman spends April taking on way too many cases and scamming his fellow lawyers into concluding plea deals with him that will allow him to make a lot of money very quickly. He does so with Bill Oakley and Suzanne Erickson and starts working with a Bluetooth headset that would eventually become a part of his daily attire. But everything changes for Jimmy when he is approached by one of his former clients with a business proposition. Nacho Varga brings Jimmy to La Salamanca, who wants Jimmy to talk to their guy in prison and give him some info to rat out a rival party. Jimmy is reluctant to accept cartel business, but does so when Lalo pays him eight grand up front and tells him he is the guy for this. Jimmy manages to engineer a deal for Lalo's guy that turns him into the DEA's personal snitch, going above and beyond what was required of him, and impresses Lalo. During this time, he is also visited by Howard Hamlin, who offers him a job at HH with a clean slate. But Jimmy, being the person he is, decides to take retribution against Howard instead and starts harassing him with bowling balls and prostitutes whilst putting off his job recommendation as much as he could. Saul Goodman also becomes involved with a certain Everett Acker on the recommendation of Kim Wexler, which leads to the couple conning Kim's client, Kevin Watchtall, into practically admitting that his father violated copyright law with Mesa Verde's logo and allows Acker to keep a hold of his land. Off the back of this victory, Saul and Kim plan the downfall of Howard Hamlin and get into the worst deal they will ever cut with anyone when they come across a certain Salamanca. Seven million. Yes, and I am so, so sorry. I can do that. May 2004, when Lalo is arrested for the murder of Fred Whelan, Nacho picks up Saul to represent him in court. Saul tries to explain to Lalo that the circumstances of his case do not make it feasible for him to get out at all, but Lalo asks him if he wants to be a friend of the cartel. Saul reluctantly agrees and demands $100,000 as his fee for bringing Lalo's bail money from across the border. After staging an elaborate hearing where he was able to successfully prove the opposition's defense had been coached, thanks to Mike, Jimmy manages to get Lalo out of jail on bail. He goes through hell to recover his money, being set upon by assassins sent by Juan Bolsa, and is only saved because Mike was out there protecting him. Oh, and Jimmy also gets married. On May 6th, James Morgan McGill gets married for the third time in his life to Kim Wexler in order to keep all their secrets safe from the scrutiny of the law. Huell serves as their witness. 
However, after getting married to Kim and going through a literal life or death situation, Jimmy realizes that the only way to cope with the stresses of his choices were to stick to the road he had chosen, as explained to him by Mike. He does so, not faltering for a single second when Lalo comes to his home to inquire about his shot up car. Saul and Kim move to a hotel temporarily to protect themselves from the consequences of the visit from Lalo and decide to put into action their biggest scam yet. The takedown of Howard Hamlet. Through a series of carefully planned steps, they are able to convince Howard's co-counsel on the Sandpiper case, Cliff Main, that he was under the influence of drugs and was into hookers. Jimmy had interrupted one of Howard's lunches with Cliff using hookers previously, so the ruse would be believable for Cliff. While their scam against Howard proceeds without a hitch, Saul Goodman finds himself a pariah at the courthouse, thanks to his defense of Jorge de Guzman, who the authorities have figured out was Lelo Salazar. Manka. Everyone thinks Saul is downright filthy for what he has done, with Suzanne Erickson even urging Kim to ask Jimmy to inform on the Salamancas. But she reminds him that being a friend of the cartel is better than being a rat. Jimmy is also rewarded for his efforts in the form of multiple new clients the next day because by this point Saul Goodman was a budding legend. People started recognizing him as Salamanca's guy and he suddenly had clients from all over Albuquerque begging him to represent them. My Aunt Fanny. 5,000 years and it never ends. Here it is, violence! It always comes to this! June 2004. Saul and Kim's scam against Howard Hamlin is successful. Using a combination of drugs, faked images and a fake PI, they managed to convince everyone involved in the Sandpiper case that Howard was out of control and get the settlement that Jimmy had been looking for all along. And after learning that Lelo was dead, Jimmy was in a celebratory mood. He and Kim were in the middle of their victory party when Howard showed up, a bottle of McCallan in his hand and accusation in his eyes. Howard expertly deduced the entire plan that Jimmy and Kim had laid out for him and then went on to call them Leopold and Loeb. He promised to bring them both to justice, but at that moment, Lelo Salamanca walked into Kim's apartment and shot Howard dead. This stunned Paul, who still at this point had assumed that Lelo was dead. The cartel boss proceeded to tell Saul about Nacho being a rat and gave him a simple mission to point and shoot at Gus Fring. Saul manages to get Kim to do it instead and Lelo ties him up leaving him staring at Howard's dead body till Mike arrives with his men. After Jimmy recounts everything that happened to Mike, he waits for Kim's return anxiously and when she comes back it's clear that things will never be the same. While Saul Goodman is able to go about his day normally, Kim Wexler isn't. When they attend Howard's funeral, his widow Cheryl nearly figures out what they did to him, but is dissuaded by Kim, who wants nothing more than to admit it. Jimmy is more than happy letting Kim handle the talking and focusing on letting the healing begin, but he doesn't realize that this is the last time he will probably ever be talking to the love of his life. The day after Howard's death, Jimmy gave Kim the same speech Mike had given him after their day in the desert. But instead of sticking it out with Jimmy, Kim decides to quit the law and leave Albuquerque because of the immense guilt she carries with her now. Not even an open admission of love from Jimmy can stop her from leaving. And so there is nothing left of James Morgan McGill in the man we now call Saul Goodman. What? All right. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. Late 2004, Saul Goodman is living his life as the ABQ's best criminal lawyer and has finalized his immortal catchphrase, better call Saul. His office looks like the one we will always remember, not the feng shui stuff that Francesca had picked out earlier, and he is waiting to attend a rather tricky piece of business. Kim returns to Albuquerque to divorce Jimmy and he puts it off until he no longer can. When he does invite Kim, in order to get over with the entire ordeal, he ignores looking at her directly and constantly works on hustling his clients and bragging about his profits. He tells Kim she is stupid for not taking her half of the Sandpiper settlement, which ended up going to him as well, and tells her to have a nice life as Emilio Koyama walks into his office. Emilio is the cousin of Crazy Eight, the same guy Saul turned into the DEA's personal snitch for Lalo. This indicates that not only has he continued to represent cartel members, he isn't averse to meth cooks as well. After finalizing his divorce to Kim, Saul dives headfirst into building his own criminal empire. 
think you're going to regret not taking your share of the sandpiper money. And then by a shitload of swampland. 2005 to 2008. In the three years that followed, Saul Goodman became the face of Albuquerque's criminal law community, for better or worse. Using his obscene wealth, Saul was able to launch an aggressive advertising campaign for his business and became something of a local celebrity as a result. He opened up at least two Shell Corps, Eye Station Zebra Associates and Tigerfish Corporation to keep his money safe, and he bought dozens of nail salons all over Albuquerque. He also bought Laserbase, which is where Price works. Saul Goodman is also the possessor of Dr. Caldera's infamous Black Book, which gives him access to the names of criminals all across the city who are useful for various purposes. This is where he would later find Patrick Kuby, the character portrayed by Bill Burr. He was also sleeping with prostitutes frequently and bought the mansion he wanted to buy with Kim earlier in his life filling it up with memorabilia of his past and other luxury items. Saul provides successful legal defense for Emilio Koyama twice, which causes Jesse Pinkman to trust him implicitly as a criminal lawyer and suggest him as the guy Walter White approaches for their badger problem. Okay, you're now both officially represented by Saul Goodman and Associates. Your secrets are safe with me. December 2008. Saul Goodman wakes up in his mansion and immediately starts working. He dismisses his lady for the night with a breakfast bar and doesn't stop talking from the moment he showers to the moment he starts driving. And even then, he only stops to critique his on-radio advertisement. His assistant, Francesca Liddy, who is now entirely implicit in his illegal business, calls him about a public masturbator who turns out to be Brandon Mayhew, a.k.a. Badger. He is visited by Badger's uncle in his office and asked not to cut a deal or give anything up to the DEA in exchange for $10,000, which he initially refuses. Saul is dragged out to the desert by Walt and Jesse, with him praying the whole time that this wasn't Lalo coming back for answers. After he realizes that Walt and Jesse are connected to Badger, he is able to talk them into hiring him as their lawyer and gives them an impromptu plan for helping Badger Badger get out of jail. After entering the RV with Walt and Jesse and seeing the lab set up in the back, he realizes that Walt is Heisenberg and promises to get his guy off clean. Saul employs Jimmy in and out to help con Albuquerque police into thinking he is Heisenberg, and it appears that that's that. However, we later find out that Saul had Mike look into Heisenberg because he thinks the guy's product is top shelf and can make a lot of money for Mike's mystery kingpin. Mike is vehemently against the idea, calling Walt a complete amateur, but Saul decides to pay Walt a visit anyway, which signifies the choice he makes that ends up ruining hundreds of lives down the line. After calling Walt out for being the equivalent of Fredo Corleone in the drug business, he offers his personal services as his lawyer and launderer and encourages him to better call Saul. Walt takes Saul up on the offer, thus starting their relationship. After Combo, one of Walt and Jesse's dealers is shot dead by a rival gang, Saul manages to convince Mike to give Walt a meeting with Gus. Walt and Jesse arrive for the meeting but don't make contact with Saul's contact. Upon inquiring what happened, Saul tells them that his contact was there and that they blew it. Let's just say I know a guy who knows a guy who knows another guy. January, February 2009. Saul Goodman sends Mike to Jesse's apartment to clean up after Jane Margolis's tragic passing. Fun fact, Bob Odenkirk was supposed to shoot this scene himself, but couldn't because of a scheduling conflict, so Mike's character was created. He lives! Happy housewarming, kid. Don't look so glad to see me. March 2009. Saul Goodman draws up a class action suit in lieu of the Wayfarer 515 tragedy and attempts to lure Walt back into the drug business. When he refuses, Saul calls Mike and has him install surveillance equipment at Walt's home, just in case they have a problem. When Walt doesn't return immediately, Saul gets to work with Jesse instead. He helps Jesse acquire his aunt's newly refurbished home by blackmailing his parents with knowledge of the meth lab and manages to close the purchase for less than half the asking price. He visits Jesse multiple times, trying to get him to get Walt cooking again, but it is to no avail. So when Jesse starts cooking again, Mike relays this information onto Gus, who buys Jesse's product and splits the payment 50-50 between him and Walt as a psychological ploy to get Walter back into cooking meth. Instead, Jesse decides to restart the crystal ship 
and he gets Badger and Skinny Pete to join him in this venture, unaware that Hank has caught on. When Hank locates Jesse's RV, Walt calls Saul, who has Francesca pose as a police officer to draw Hank away from the RV. After Hank brutalizes Jesse, Saul is giddy at the prospect of getting Schrader for police brutality, but privately muses that they might have to get rid of Jesse if he becomes a problem. Later, he gives Jesse advice on how to launder his money if he wants to keep his riches and offers him the nail salon he was getting a manicure and pedicure at. Saul is also also briefly fired by Walt for having bugged his home, but that is promptly ignored once the cousins turn up as dead bodies and Walt realizes who their target really was. What concerns him more is the fact that Skylar has discovered his business, but Saul manages to contend that she won't be a credible witness even if Walt goes to trial. What are we saying is the source of this money? That's simple. April 2009. After Skylar White decides to become Walt's new money launderer, she meets with Saul and instantly rejects all his ideas for prospective options. Saul and Skylar do not like each other, but Walt assures both of them that they are the right people for their respective job. Saul and Walt realize that Jesse is about to kill some of Gus's dealers in retaliation for getting his friend Combo killed by his current girlfriend, Andrea's brother Thomas. After Walt helps clear Jesse with Gus and then protects him from Gus's anger by taking out the problematic dealers himself, Saul helps Walt stash Jesse and even lies to Mike about his whereabouts. He later brings Walt to Laser Base, where Jesse is hiding, and facilitates the meeting between them that eventually leads to the death of Gail Berticher. After Mike threatens to beat Saul till his legs don't work, he hires Hurl Bebino again as his full-time bodyguard. Justice. So if you want to tip the scales back in your favor, Better call Saul. May to July 2009. Saul Goodman puts Walter White in touch with Lawson, who gives Walt an untraceable gun strictly for defense. He also puts Skylar White in touch with QB, who she uses to successfully scam Bogdan into selling the car wash to the White family. Though Saul manages to pull it out of the bag for Walter every time he is called upon, it seems like Walter always has more for him to deal with. When Walter realizes that Hank has procured Gail Botticher's lab notes and might be able to catch on to him, he asks Saul to help him. Saul suggests that Walt disappear with his family, but also states that it is a last minute resort, which causes Walt to reconsider. In June, after Walt destroys a Dodge Challenger out of the stress of dealing with Gus, he asks Saul if he can hire Hitman. Saul points out that Mike knows all the hitmen he knows, so it would be next to impossible to do so. He helps Jesse deliver money to Andrea and Brock Cantillo, and asks him why he doesn't see them himself, unaware of Walt's manipulation. He instead helps the Whites solve the Beneke problem, which arises when Skylar realizes that Ted defaulting on his tax payments could implicate her as well, thereby ruining Walt's business. Saul calls Ted into his office and presents him an inheritance from his fiction aunt Burgett, with the amount being nearly exactly the sum he owes to the IRS. When Ted uses the inheritance to indulge himself instead, Saul points this out to Skylar White, who asks him to handle the situation. Saul sends Huel and QB to Ted's place to convince him to pay his taxes, and while the intimidation works, Ted slips and falls trying to escape the two men, and nearly dies in the process. He is forever terrified of Skylar thereafter, and ponies up immediately. Saul has bigger problems on his hands when he realizes Gus is about to kill Walt. He suggests Walt disappear with his entire family but when Walt is unable to do that, thanks to Skylar giving away all their money, he comes up with a different plan. Using Saul and Huel, Walt pickpockets the ricin cigarette from Jesse and makes it appear as if Gus has poisoned Brock. He has Saul keep up the pretense of being unaware of the poisoning attempt whilst acting as his liaison with Jesse, because Jesse gets picked up by the cops for being a bit too specific with the description of Brock's illness. Saul gets Jesse out of there instantly and also 
also passes along the information that eventually allows Walt to win his war with Gus. Saul reveals Tio's location and grudge with Gus to Walt, who uses it to kill three birds with one stone. Saul visits Skylar at the car wash to inform her that Ted Beneke has woken up and advises Junior to call him if he ever drinks and drives, and later, after Walt is done tying up loose ends from Gus's death, he confronts Saul about the Beneke payment. Saul counters by saying the payment kept Walt safe and that he too had Saul unwittingly poison a child, and screams that they are done. Walt menacingly stalks Saul and tells him they are done when he says they are oh, done. Uh, Shelling out money to the ex and her little boy, I kind of get it. I mean, kind of, but this... <laughs> August to October 2009. Saul Goodman continues to serve as Walter White's go-to counsel and is now integral to his business. Goodman helps Walt acquire Vamonos Pest, which ends up becoming his new in-town front for cooking meth. Despite Saul's suggestion of retirement, Walt is adamant to start anew. Saul is present when Mike, Walt and Jesse decide the percentages and responsibilities of everyone involved. He privately asks if Walt is okay with letting Mike run the business, to which Walt replies that he runs Mike. When Mike is picked up by the DEA for questioning, he initially goes alone, but after getting tailed incessantly, he brings in Saul, who files a restraining order against the DEA on grounds of stalking. It turns out that Saul was correct in worrying about Mike, but for entirely different reasons. The lawyer Mike had hired to pay off Gus's guy had flipped on him and had put everyone at risk. So when Walt calls Mike with this information from Saul's office, Mike wants Saul to deliver a duffel bag to him to facilitate his escape. Walt goes instead and Mike never returns, which gives Saul pretty much the right idea of what exactly happened to Mike. He becomes even more scared of Walter and does as he is asked to do. Answer that phone and traders on the other end of the line with a legal wiretap recording everything you say you're not doing anybody any favors. November 2009 to March 2010. Over the course of five months, Walter White and Saul Goodman earn millions of dollars thanks to their new meth operation, whose reach extends to the Czech Republic now. Throwing thoughts out there. This is a safe room, right? Jesus. Send him to Belize. March 2010. Saul Goodman alerts Walter White as to the guilty conscience of his former business associates. Jesse has just showed up at his office with his five million and he wanted to give it away to the families of Drew Sharp and Kaylee Ermentot. Saul holds onto the money for Walt and gives it to him after he believes that Jesse has been placated enough. The bigger problem arrives in the form of Hank discovering Walt is Heisenberg. Saul immediately suggests sending Hank to Belize just like Mike, but Walt angrily shoots the idea down. Instead, as soon as he realizes he has been made, he makes Huel and QB pick up his cash and bring it to Saul's office in 750 gallon barrels, which he personally buries in the desert. Saul tells Walt that most of what Hank knows is not something the DEA would buy, and Walt creates a fake confession that seemingly ends Hank's dream of catching Heisenberg. But where one door closes, another blows open. Jesse is arrested and brought in front of Hank. Saul bails him out but chastises him for his decisions and involves Walt in the discussion about Jesse's future. Slowly, deceptively but surely, Walt is able to convince Jesse to leave Albuquerque and disappear. But when Jesse shows up at Saul's office for his appointment with a disappearer, high and in possession of weed, Saul has Huel lift the stuff lest Ed rejects taking Jesse. But this would turn out to be his undoing. Jesse connects the dots and realizes that Walt had Brock poisoned with Saul's help. So he goes to Saul's office, beats him up and steals his car to go confront Walt. After Walt discovers Saul's car outside his home and his living room covered in gasoline, he realizes Jesse has snapped and calls Saul to discuss options. Saul once again suggests sending Jesse to Belize, but Walt shoots it down, stating he will not entertain such options even though it is what he ends up doing anyway. Thanks to the disappearance of two DEA agents and the fact that most of the people Walt was close to now hated him, news of his identity as Heisenberg broke and spread like wildfire across America. 
years. If I'm lucky, a month from now, best case scenario, I'm managing a Cinnabon in Omaha. You're still part of this, whether you like it. April 2010 to September 2010. Saul Goodman realizes his ride is pretty much over and tears apart his office, gathering up all the valuables that he can carry with him after he disappears. He has Francesca shred all the documents that are present at the office and then dump them five miles away from the office. He also tells her to be present at a certain payphone on November the 12th of the same year to attend a call, and she agrees, but says that if it doesn't ring, she will be leaving. Saul assures her that it will ring, and then offers her a hug, which she rejects with disgust evident on her face. She then calls Ed the Disappearer and orders a pickup. Arriving at Ed's store, he has his picture taken and is asked to bunk with another occupant, who turns out to be Walter White. As it happens, relocating Walt has been a particularly difficult task and Saul is admittedly still kind of afraid of him when he enters the basement of Ed's shop. He tells Walt that it is all over and if he himself was lucky, his best case scenario was becoming a Cinnabon manager in Omaha someday. Walt tries to assert it's not over once again, but his coughing bout spells the end of their arrangement. Later, when Walt is fixing the basement out of frustration, Saul asks him where he would go if Walt had a time machine, and Walt simply berates him for having been a con man his entire life. The next time we see the man we know and somewhat love as Saul Goodman, he is going by the name Gene Takovich. What my dad took for like pancreatic cancer. So, a guy with cancer can't be an asshole? Huh, believe me, I speak from experience. October 2010. In October 2010, Gene Takovich works as an assistant manager of a Cinnabon in a mall in Omaha, Nebraska. Though he has a regular routine and a seemingly regular life, he is clearly paranoid 24-7 and reminisces about his old life constantly. He watches tapes of his old advertisements when he is free and is generally severely depressed about the state of things. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman and I will do the fighting for you. No charge is too big for me when legal forces have you cornered. One time he gets locked in a trash room of the mall where he works and refuses to ring the emergency bell, worried that his rescuers might just as easily become his prosecutors. He spends the entire night waiting for someone to open the door while growing ever more anxious. Finally, when the door is opened, he silently strides out and it is revealed that he has scratched SG was here into the wall of the trash room. Jean later passes out while working at the Cinnabon out of sheer stress because he thinks that giving legal advice to a criminal he spotted at the mall might have blown his cover. Instead, it's the cabbie that comes to pick him up that realizes his true identity, with the driver, Jeff, being a huge fan of Saul Goodman. Jean manages to get Jeff to stay silent but is perturbed by being made. So he calls Ed to disappear once again. But he seemingly changes his mind and says he'll take care of it himself. I'm gonna fix it myself. And returns to Jeff with a proposition. Saul, Jeff and Jeff's buddy run a scam at the mall where they make off with tons of expensive contraband in the form of luxury clothes. Saul seemingly orchestrated the scam to buy Jeff's silence, but not being able to resist his own nature, embarks on more such scams with his new lackeys. One of his marks turns out to be a cancer patient, and Saul is ruthless enough to go after him despite his condition, his recent experiences with cancer patients having soured him on the entire disease itself. Saul manages to run a tight ship and steer clear of the cops, just like he used to. K, I gave it to the feds. You did what? Why would you do that? Time has expired. God damn it! November 12th, 2010. Jean Takovich calls Francesca Liddy at the promised date and time to get an update from her on the state of things back home and is disheartened to find that everything and everyone he knew in his previous life was either gone or vanished. He beseeches Francesca to give him some good news, but the best she can manage to come up with is the fact that Kim called, asking about Jimmy six years after their divorce. Saul calls Kim immediately after he is done with Francesca and starts talking about wanting to catch up as if nothing had happened. But realizing that Kim's conscience was weighing heavy on her breaks into his accusatory routine that Kim has heard and seen a million times over by now. 
Sol starts telling Kim she should turn herself in if she feels that guilty, but then tries to apologize for it. But Kim simply tells him she is glad he is alive and cuts the call. A frustrated Sol breaks the glass of the phone booth and smashes the receiver on the bank multiple times, frustrated at not being able to catch a break. Sol decides to run that scam on the cancer guy anyway and break into his home in the middle of the night, with Jeff as his getaway driver. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Jeff gets caught by the police, but Jimmy promises to give him the best criminal defense that he can provide and goes to meet Jeff's mother, Marion, to help her bail out her son. But once he arrives, he realizes that Marion has discovered who he is. Marion is an avid fan of YouTube, and a quick search for Conman plus Albuquerque yielded up Saul Goodman to her. Saul tries to threaten Marion into staying quiet, even moving to possibly kill her, but she manages to call the cops on him and he is captured from a dumpster where he was desperately trying to call Ed for another pickup. See? Told you. It's better call Saul. December 2010. Saul Goodman hires Bill Oakley, the beat lawyer he used to compete with as his defense attorney and proceeds to represent himself for the most part during his dealings with federal prosecutors. Using his immense acting capacity and his legal knowledge, he is able to poke enough loopholes in the government's case to get himself a mere seven and a half year sentence, and also manages to avoid spending that term inside of ADX Montrose, one of those worst prisons in New Mexico. Saul appears rather proud of himself for being able to get such a lenient sentence in light of his crimes, but he realizes that this is the only chance he has left to redeem his humanity. So he calls Kim and asks her to attend his hearing. At the hearing, Saul goes back on his signed confession to the government and gives a proper, more accurate confession from the stand, admitting everything about Walt, Howard, Chuck and everything in between. This act gets his sentence increased to 86 years. He also insists that the judge call him Jimmy McGill and gives Kim a look that says, I heard you and I am sorry for taking this long to do the right thing. Jimmy is taken to ADX Montrose, naturally, and on his way there, the entire bus full of inmates starts chanting, Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul. Once he gets there, he is visited by Kim, who tells him her New Mexico bar license doesn't have an expiration date, so she came to see him. They share a cigarette as Kim bemoans the fact that Jimmy got his sentence upped from seven and a half to 86. Jimmy simply replies that with good behavior, who knows how his life will play out. The final shot we see of James Morgan McGill, Victor Sinclair, Gene Takovich, Saul Goodman is him standing on the prison exercise yard, staring intently at Kim as she exits the prison. He blows two finger guns at her and exits the screen, bringing his life story to an end. If he hadn't walked into my office that day, Walter White would have been dead or behind bars within a month. Post-sentencing. It is implied that James McGill was transferred to Bernalillo County Detention Center after a few years, thanks to the good behavior he was referring to with Kim. Saul Goodman is currently serving an 86-year sentence, which gets over in 2096, technically. Jimmy was born in 1960 and captured in 2010, exactly at the age of 50. It is unlikely he will ever see his prison sentence reduced or even get the time to see the light of day again, but he will live free of the shackles he put upon himself. After spending 50 years as a mostly free man, Jimmy McGill, aka Saul Goodman, will spend the rest of his life behind bars. And while we aren't thrilled at the prospect, following the franchise finale, we can certainly say that there was no more fitting end for him. This is the full timeline of the descent of a young kid from Cicero into a life of organized crime and how it took realizations that came from within for him to come to terms with his destructiveness. Jimmy McGill is not a person who we should be feeling sorry for. He has conned his way into every criminal lifestyle possibility imaginable. And perhaps that is the lesson that the showrunners wanted to give us with his story. 
Better Call Saul showed us how the loss of moral fibre can push people beyond what can be defined as a limit and then some, and cautions us to never take the chances that Jimmy did, lest we find ourselves spread-eagled in front of a ditch out in the desert. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do, and so do I. I believe.